All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, lecture number four. Yep. All right. All right. Welcome to lecture number four on the cosmic microwave background. So in today's lecture, we will discuss CMB tests of inflation, and in particular, what you can do with the CMB polarization. So let me start off by reminding you of what we discussed last time. OK, so last time, we refined our discussion of the CMB power spectrum, adding to the acoustic oscillations and baryonic effects that we discussed previously, the Doppler term, the damping, the silk damping, and the effect of reionization. And then at the end from this, at the end of this discussion, the final output of our calculations and arguments was the solid blue curve that you can see uh, here in my terrible sketch. But actually, I think it's you know, not all that terrible. If you compare with the CMB power spectrum peaks, indeed, you see exactly the structures in the real data and in the more detailed Boltzmann code that we derived using our you know, somewhat more approximate uh, fluid arguments and adding on top of that the damping. So we've done a pretty good job at understanding why the CMB looks the way it does. And we've reproduced all of the main features. And in the second part of last lecture, we turned this around and said, you know, given that we now know the physics of the CMB, and we understand why it looks the way it does, now let's use the CMB as a tool to learn about cosmological parameters to learn about the composition of the universe. Okay. And what's shown here is just how well this kind of procedure works. Right? It really is amazing that you know, we understand our CMB so well, and our measurements are so good, that we can determine the baryon density to you know, 0.02237 plus or minus 0.0015, for example, and the CDM density to you know, similar accuracy and the, you know, the Hubble constant to plus or minus 0.5. Right? So this is extremely high precision, and it's a real achievement. Uh, we, you know, this, is, this is real precision cosmology we're doing with the Planck uh, CMB measurements. And you get sort of similar uh, constraints from other experiments as well, uh, such as the Atacama Cosmology Telescope and the South Pole Telescope. So the CMB has been crucial uh, for telling us what the universe is made of. But it's also been a remarkably powerful way to test what happened in the early universe and what set the initial conditions. And we started that discussion last time. Uh, but today I want to focus on testing the early universe with the CMB, and in particular testing our best uh, current sort of model, which is inflation, using the cosmic microwave background. And I start, I'll start by discussing how far we can get in terms of testing inflation with the CMB temperature. But then I'll argue that we need other observables as well if we want to continue to make progress. And I'll explain to you uh, some of the basics of the CMB polarization and why it's a remarkably powerful probe of inflation uh, through the observable of CMB B modes. OK, let's get started. And Given that there were a few questions about uh, this, I thought it would be worthwhile just quickly beginning with a lightning review of some of these sort of inflationary basics and inflationary calculations. But this will be quick. I'm sure many of you already know all this, but let's just make sure we're on the same page here before we discuss the observables in detail. OK, so here's my sort of quick lightning reminder of, it, of the basics of inflation. Okay, So inflation was proposed to solve problems in cosmology at the background level. Right? Solve problems like the flatness problem, or the sort of more basic horizon problem of why the CMB has the same temperature, even though different regions never talk to each other. And it solves these problems by invoking a period in the early universe of accelerated expansion, where the naive horizon shrinks and where the universe gets made large and uh, flat. 
So inflation is successful at solving these problems, uh, these sort of background problems. And usually this is done, this is achieved with a scalar field. And the picture that's usually invoked is you have a slowly rolling scalar field that's rolling down a potential. And so how do you get this exponential, uh, this, this accelerated expansion? How do you get the fact that the horizon shrinks? Well, the way this works is that the field is rolling really, really slowly. The kinetic energy is very, very small, and the energy is dominated by the potential energy, which is nearly constant along this trajectory. So therefore, the Hubble parameter is also nearly constant. So I have a nearly constant Hubble parameter, and that clearly is going to give me an exponentially uh, growing scale factor, accelerated expansion, and a shrinking horizon. Okay, so that's the sort of background story for inflation. And the inflation was proposed to solve these background problems, but amazingly, soon after, people realized that inflation naturally makes another prediction. It also predicts a mechanism for generating the initial you know, perturbations from which over billions and billions of years all the structure in our universe grew. Right? And I think this is a really amazing idea. And it emerges naturally from just treating the inflaton field quantum mechanically and allowing it to have quantum fluctuations. Right? And these quantum fluctuations will then turn into real density variations that grow into the structures we see. Okay, so in more detail, here's how this works. Just to remind you of some of these basics. Uh, Normally, the way you, you, you can think about this inflaton field value is you can think of it as a clock that parametrizes how long you have until the end of inflation. Okay, so if it's far to the left, you have a lot of inflationary time left. If it's to the right, you have very little. Right? Inflation in this picture ends here. Now, you will have quantum fluctuations in the value of this phi field, delta phi. And what will these do? Right? What these will do is if the field fluctuates sort of to the right in this picture, inflation will go on for less long. And if it fluctuates to the left, inflation will last for longer. All right? So that's this expression here, that there's a quantum fluctuation in the phi field value will correspond to a fluctuation in how long inflation lasts. And now, there's a nice picture for why that should produce uh, curvature perturbations. Just imagine you have a surface in different regions. You're expanding by different amounts. You'll end up with a sort of spatially curved surface. So that's maybe some very basic intuition, but you can also obviously show this a lot more formally. Okay, so inflation, quantum fluctuations lead to different durations of inflation in different parts of the universe, and that gives you a curvature perturbation. This time perturbation I talked about here, uh, as I said, uh, can be more formally related uh, to the fluctuation in the inflaton field delta phi. Okay, so this approximate statement is how we go from quantum fluctuations in a field, the inflaton field phi, to real curvature perturbations that then provide the origin of all structure, right? And the origin of the fluctuations in the CMB. So all we need to do is compute the properties of these quantum fluctuations, and then we get our beautiful inflationary predictions for, for a structure. Just to remind you of all this. Okay, so how do we, how do, we do this? In a very uh, simplistic way, just to remind you, we write down to compute the predictions of in inflation for the quantum fluctuations, we write down an action for the scalar field. We expand the scalar field as a background plus a small fluctuation f. And then you can easily show that the equation of motion for this inflaton field fluctuation gives you this equation, the Mukhanov-Sasaki equation. And the nice thing about that equation is when k is very large, 
In other words, when you're dealing with subhorizon scales, this equation is just like a harmonic oscillator. And so everything you learn in basic quantum mechanics and how to quantize the harmonic oscillator just carries over to each k mode of the field. Okay, so each Fourier mode of the field behaves on subhorizon scales just like a harmonic oscillator, and you can quantize it and you can deal with its quantum fluctuations in exactly the same way. Okay, so you now promote this classical field Fk for each mode uh, to an operator, introduce raising and lowering operators, write it in terms of this mode expansion, and now you can compute zero point fluctuations. Okay, so if you, just like you have in a harmonic oscillator, because every k-mode behaves just like a harmonic oscillator, you have a non-zero expectation value of the square of the value of that mode. Okay, and the square of the value of a mode is basically the power spectrum, and so we've shown that from quantum fluctuations, the uh, inflaton field obtains a non-zero power spectrum. And therefore, we also will obtain a non-zero uh, spectrum of fluctuations because I can confer, convert from F to phi and from phi fluctuations to curvature perturbations. And from that, I can you know, evolve the whole universe. Okay, are, are there any questions about this sort of, this lightning review of inflation basics? All right, so I'm, I'm, hopefully you've seen a lot of this before. And I'm sure you have. Okay, and so what comes out if you do this a little more quantitatively is that this non-zero power spectrum in particular evaluates to the quantity on the right the power spectrum of uh, curvature perturbations is given by uh, the Hubble rate during inflation and the first slow roll parameter epsilon, which tells you, you know, basically how much the Hubble rate is changing uh, per e-fold. And the key point is that this is, evalu this is evaluated uh, at when a mode leaves the horizon. But the key point is that both the Hubble parameter and the, f the first Hubble slow roll parameter are varying really slowly. These are almost constant. And so this spectrum, inflation predicts, should be almost scale invariant, with, but maybe not perfectly scale invariant, with small departures from scale invariance. Okay, so a nearly scale invariant spectrum of curvature perturbations is the inflationary prediction, and uh, the power spectrum should be proportional to k to the ns minus 1, where ns is very close to 1. That's what you would expect. And, you know, the departures come about because slow roll parameters are non-zero. The Hubble parameter is varying a little bit as the field slowly rolls down its hill, for example. All right, so that's just a review of the basics. And that's the first inflationary prediction that we will want to test. There's another inflationary prediction that we will discuss in this, in this lecture. And that is that inflation also predicts a background of primordial gravitational waves. Okay, so this is a really uh, neat prediction, and it would be really cool if we could observe that, and we'll get back to this. All right, so the nice thing about this calculation is it basically proceeds just as, we, as for the normal scalar curvature perturbation calculation. So you don't just have fluctuations in the inflaton that you should consider. You can also have fluctuations in the metric in particular in this transverse uh, trace-free perturbation to the spatial part of the metric Eij. Okay, so I can write this Eij tensor as without loss of generality in terms of two gravitational wave polarizations, F plus and F cross, that you're probably familiar with from uh, some treatments of gravitational waves that you've seen. We have these two polarization, one that's oscillating like this, and the other one that's oscillating at 45 degrees to it. And what's nice is that if you put this expression in the action, in the gravitational action, you get the exact same 
you know, oscillator-like equation of motion for the two polarizations, F cross and F plus, uh, of the gravitational waves as you got for the inflaton fluctuation F. Okay, so we can just carry all the results that we got for calculating the curvature perturbation, the scalar perturbation, over to the gravitational wave computation. Okay, so just like we found uh, for the scalar curvature perturbation, we also will get a prediction of a nearly scale invariant power spectrum of gravitational waves. Okay, so we can go through the same, you know, just like a harmonic oscillator, we quantize it, et cetera. This is what you get. Again, a scale invariant power spectrum of gravitational waves or a scale invariant uh, tensor power spectrum, in other words. Actually, it's a tiny bit different because gravitational waves are a more direct prediction. They just get produced and they travel to us and you don't have to do this extra step of converting from delta phi to the curvature perturbation, which adds a little bit of uh, some details. All right, are there any questions about these sort of basic inflationary predictions? Anything you want to discuss in more detail? Okay. Even if you were completely lost here, which I'm sure most of you were not, Inflation predicts the scale invariant spectrum of curvature perturbations and gravitational waves. And this is what we'd like to test. Okay, so how can we test these predictions that come out from uh, inflation? There's one question from Tim. Oh, yeah? What would be the amplitude of the gravitational waves? Yeah, that's a very good question, right? And it depends on basically the Hubble parameter during inflation. Okay? So, or if you want to, if you want to, yeah, so, so it just depends you know, roughly the level of gravitational waves compared to the scalars depends on the energy scale of inflation. Okay, the higher the energy scale, the larger the level of gravitational waves you predict. All right, good. We would like to test these inflationary predictions. All right, and we want to test them. Let's start off by seeing how far we can get with the CMB temperature in terms of testing inflation. So to remind you, we wrote down and we derived an expression for the power spectrum of the CMB, which was the initial condition power spectrum times the transfer function squared, okay, with a certain K, uh, with, with K evaluated at uh, L, e, L over chi. Now, we also derived that the large scale limit of the transfer function is this. This is the the, you know, our most detailed computation with baryons, and the transfer function is just this expression uh, without R. And so if you take the low K large scale limit, or more precisely, you take the limit where KRS is much less than one, which is the super horizon limit, this transfer function for the sachs wolf term just approaches a constant a constant of minus one-fifth, okay? Now that's kind of amazing, because it means that if we're looking on scales where KRS is much less than one, in other words, on super horizon scales, this corresponds to multiples of L below, you know, significantly below 100, then that transfer function is a constant. In other words, we are seeing the primordial modes. Okay? When you look in the sky, in the CMB, on really large scales, you're seeing, you know, the initial conditions, basically, right? Without any causal processing. And to some extent, that makes sense, right? Because if I'm looking at fluctuations over scales that are super horizon, causal physics, pressure forces, all, you know, all these sorts of things can't have messed um, with with the modes on those scales, right? So on smaller scales, I can have all this complicated acoustic physics, but it's never going to affect separations larger than the horizon. And th therefore, it makes sense that that transfer function should just be a constant, and I'm just imaging uh, the initial conditions, right? OK, so on super horizon scales, uh, on, on large scales in the CMB, we're directly seeing the primordial fluctuations with a few caveats uh, like, like their late time effects that can also contribute. 
Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So this, the transfer function is basically, I should have just not written down RK here. The transfer function is just this expression without RK, okay? Um, and the RK is, is in here, right? Uh, so, you know, basically on large scales you're seeing RK, or R of X, or something like that. Um, yeah, and and you know you're seeing at low at low at low k at low l you're just directly measuring this primordial power spectrum. That's another way of saying that. All right, and so what we'd expect if inflation, you know, what inflation would predict is, as we said, a scale invariant spectrum. So that means that this this power spectrum should be flat should be constant. So we'd expect a plateau at low L, right? Scale invariant spectrum, we expect a plateau. Let's look at what we find. This is what we find. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty neat, right? We do actually find the scale invariant spectrum on super horizon scales. And it's also, I think, particularly amazing that indeed we see correlations of modes on scales that in the standard hot Big Bang picture could have never talked to each other, right? So there's, in some sense, if we had known about this before inflation was developed, that would have been an you know, even more extreme horizon problem. How did the fluctuations on this part of the sky know about the fluctuations on that part of the sky, right? How do I introduce super horizon correlations? And that kind of screams out for a mechanism like inflation where the naive horizon shrinks, right? And where I can generate these uh, super horizon correlations. Now, okay, so you could say I'm going to look at that, I see super horizon correlations, I'm done. I've proved something like inflation has to have happened. But there are some caveats here. And indeed, when this was discovered, I think, you know, a lot of alternatives to inflation didn't work so well anymore, but people were kind of able to evade this, right? And to some extent, uh, you know, there, there are two ways you can do this. Uh, first of all, if you have things that are produced nearby, um, like the integrated sachs wolf effect, those are actually sub-horizon but close. And so they can still show up here at low L. And indeed, part of this plateau is actually from the integrated sachs wolf effect, and that is uh, fully causal. Um, and the other, I mean, actually, if, if you're a real skeptic, you could say, this is a positive power spectrum. Random noise, random correlations, if I just throw down random noise, can still give me a positive power spectrum. I'm squaring that, and I can still get a positive value. So for example, if you imagine putting down just sort of Poisson point sources, and you compute what the prediction for the CL is, it's a constant, right? So it's, it's not that hard to generate sort of uh, false, you know, positive power that isn't a real super horizon correlation. So what you'd really like is you would really like an anti-correlation. Because if you see a negative power spectrum that has support on super horizon scales, you can't mimic that just with sort of random uh, noise and random point source. It's much harder to, I mean, it's easy to add sort of positive power. It's much harder to, if you see something negative, that has to be a real anti-correlation, the phases really have to know about each other. And fortunately, we'll come back to that soon, there is a prediction for a super horizon negative power spectrum, and that is the CMB T cross E mode polarization. And we'll come back to what that means shortly. But you know, these data points here look very unassuming. The fact that below L of 100, there, there are negative data points, doesn't look like much. But that is, I think, very strong evidence that something like inflation has to have operated. Something has to have set up an anti-correlation between fluctuations in this part of the sky and in that part of the sky that naively never talk to each other. So I think that's very strong evidence. All right, any questions about that?
Right. What else can we test with the CMB? Uh, in particular with the CMB temperature. Well, we can further test this prediction for the spectral index. Remember we talked about the fact that inflation uh, predicts an almost perfectly scale invariant spectrum, but not quite. So it's almost scale invariant, and S should be really close to one, but not exactly one. And again, we talked about how we can measure uh, the tilt, the spectral tilt, the spectrum of the initial condition power spectrum, just by looking at how the CMB power spectrum is sort of pivoted. And what we see in Planck is this. This is the Planck measurement, and it's exactly you know, what you would expect. It's something that's close to one, but not quite. Uh, 0 0.967 plus or minus 0 0.06. All right, so I think that's, again, a nice uh, confirmation of the inflationary picture. Can I quickly ask? Yeah. So, and uh, it's obvious that the small departure from one should have been, so NS should be less than one and not more than one, um, or not? I, I don't think that's tr necessarily true, right? So I think, I think you know, NS minus one depends on uh, two slow roll parameters, right? Two Hubble slow roll parameters, uh, epsilon and eta. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think you could, uh, you know, I think, I guess epsilon, you should expect it to be rolling down the hill. So if it were dominated by epsilon, you would expect it to be negative. But it, I think now we know it's actually dominated by eta, so I think it could have, have either sign. I mean, Meridad, do you agree? Yeah. So I think it just should be close to one. It's not so clear that it should be uh, less than one. Okay. Uh, good. So this is what Planck measures. There are also lots of additional tests in the CMB temperature uh, that inflation, where inflation has made uh, predictions, to some extent at least, and that have all successfully passed. So from inflation, because you just have one degree of freedom in the beginning, a, a scale of perturbation, you should only generate adiabatic modes that are fully described uh, by a sort of time translation or more hand wavily that you know, the composition of the universe should be the same everywhere. Okay? You know, the ratios of baryons to dark matter. Right? Um, and you can test that. And you can test whether I only have adiabatic perturbations or whether I could have isocurvature perturbations, perturbations where the ratios of the different substances vary. Uh, just a second. We had yeah. a question in the, in the thing. Okay. But it was, again, asking about NS being yeah. less than 1. And Blake told us that it could have gone either way. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So you could have, a, you know, if you have something that's not inflation or more complicated sort of multi-field models, you could have you know, variations in the composition of substances uh, from point to point, and that's what we sort of call uh, isocurvature perturbations. And those produce a, a different CMB power spectrum. And so the way to understand that is we talked about how normal inflation, standard single field slow roll inflation, just makes a pure cosine mode because that initial condition is constant and set at early times, and it's not evolving. But if I have isocurvature perturbations, you can show that then you no longer have a perfectly conserved and constant initial condition. It can start to vary, and it'll excite some degree of the sine oscillation as well. All right, so you won't just get a pure cosine transfer function. You will get some sinusoidal transfer function as well, and you can look for that, and you don't find it. Okay, so there's no evidence for anything but adiabatic perturbations. And in addition, single field slow roll inflation produces a very small level of uh, non-Gaussianity. And indeed, that's consistent with our current observations that have, uh, that have found the, uh, the field to be Gaussian at a level of, of a few parts in 10 to the 5. So, you know, when you, when you measure F and L of 5, remember that's in units of sort of 10 to the 5. Right? So it's very Gaussian. Sorry, Gary? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I mean, basically, uh, if I recall correctly, it's just that you, you know, you excite some sinusoidal um, part in the transfer function as well. And so rather than having, you know, something that's sort of pure cosine, you'll have a contribution that's a little bit out of phase also. And so what you'll do is you'll, you know, slightly shift these peaks, uh, these peak positions. So. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, just adding a sign to that will, like, slightly mess with the, with the peak positions. That's sort of my recollection. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So, so far, inflation has been uh, quite successful in terms of its predictions, but we would like to uh, test it further, and we would imp all of these tests have been at the level of the sort of scalar perturbations. What would be really cool is if we could test the prediction of the gravitational wave background from the early universe. All right, that would be really amazing. And not only would it be a great confirmation of inflation, arguably you could argue that, you know, you could argue that there's already been a ton of tests. But, you know, maybe more interestingly, you would learn so much, you would learn a ton about the details of how inflation happened. So it would be, you know, the smoking gun evidence, but it would also tell you a lot more about uh, some of the details. For example, as I mentioned earlier, we would learn about the energy scale at which inflation happens, if we could detect this background of gravitational waves. And if you combine the scalar and tensor perturbations, you can sort of pin down what kind of inflation models uh, could be viable. So that's really powerful. It's amazing that we'd be able to constrain physics at you know, energy is a trillion times higher than the LHC, but it, but it is possible. Okay, but so how can we find, how can we go after these inflationary gravitational waves? All right, so we want to test this inflationary prediction that at some level, at least, you should produce gravitational waves in the same way that we produce scalar perturbations. Now, the most simple-minded thing you could do is you could say, well, why don't I just look for patterns in the CMB uh, in the CMB temperature. Okay, so we discussed uh, the fact that variations in density and, and potential produce CMB temperature anisotropies. And if I have a gravitational wave that's sort of stretching and squashing space, uh, you can show that it also produces anisotropies in the CMB temperature. Okay? There's a term that depends on HIJ in that expression for, you know, you don't just have the Sachs-Wolf and Doppler, you also now have a term that is proportional to the gravitational wave um, evaluated on the last scattering surface. Now, what's the problem with that? Why can't I just go look for gravitational waves in the CMB temperature? Any ideas? Yeah, so, so basically, let me illustrate that, the problem, and this is a, kind of a cartoon, but here's a map, here's a simulation of uh, the CMB temperature on a 10 by 10 degree patch, so I've cut out a CMB temperature uh, map, and there's no gravitational wave signals in here. And now I've, I'm going to add an additional signal at the level of gravitational waves that we're hoping to see with, you know, next generation experiments. Okay, so here's... CMB temperature pattern with no gravitational waves, and here's the pattern with gravitational waves. Okay? <laughs> now, I actually have cheated and copied the same image twice, but like, it is actually really small. Um, uh, but you do see the problem, right? It's not, it's hard to find a tiny signal if there's a bunch of other fluctuations on top. Or more formally, uh, you, you know, there's a, it's difficult to find low levels of R if you can confuse them with the normal sort of boring scalar perturbations that we know are present in the CMB temperature. Right. And to make it even more uh, quantitative, there's cosmic variance from the scalar perturbations, from the Sachs-Wolf term, from the Doppler term, et cetera. Uh, well, mainly from the Sachs-Wolf term. Okay, so that's why we've sort of run out of room for searching for inflationary gravitational waves in the temperature. We're just, it's hidden. If it's, if it's there, it's hidden underneath all these enormous scalar perturbations that 
uh, we see here. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, so, so um, it will basically change the, the, the spectrum of the, it'll change the CMB power spectrum. And in particular, it'll boost the amount of sort of large scale fluctuations that you have. So there's sort of a pretty red spectrum. And so there'll be sort of more large scale fluctuations. Um, yeah. Uh, but. But you know, as I said, we, we now know the levels are small enough that you, you won't see that. OK? A question in the chat said, are these gravity waves from the Big Bang? Or Big Bang? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you, if you say that the phase of inflation is before the hot Big Bang phase, then they're gravitational waves from before the Big Bang, if you want to make it sound really dramatic. But phase, they're gravitational waves produced during inflation. All right, so we've run out of room to look for these inflationary gravitational waves in the CMB temperature, and we need to come up with a new observable uh, to look for them in. And that's where the CMB polarization comes in. And the CMB polarization is generally just an amazing CMB observable. OK, so that brings me to the second part of my talk. Let's introduce the CMB polarization, discussing the basics of what produces CMB polarization, and then talk about um, the spectra, and finally we'll talk about testing inflation with a particular type of polarization, the CMBB modes. All right, basics of CMB polarization. So we know that the CMB is weakly polarized. We can measure this, and we've measured it for some time now, and it's polarized at the 10% level. And that's shown by this uh, this image from WMAP, this is one of the you know, earlier measurements of CMB polarization. And you can see you know, the direction in which the CMB is polarized represented with this, these sort of, this map of rods, right? The rod tells you which direction the CMB uh, light is linearly polarized in. Okay? And the magnitude tells you the strength of the polarization. So why is the CMB polarized? Why would the CMB be polarized? The short story is the CMB is polarized by scattering of anisotropic incident radiation. Okay, what do I mean by that? Why is the CMB polarized by a scattering of anisotropic incident radiation? Okay, so what I'd like you to imagine is that this... Uh, this screen is the last scattering surface. So this is a small segment of the last scattering surface. And this green dot there is an electron that's sitting at the last scattering surface. Now this electron, I'd like you to further imagine, has around it variations in the incident, in the strength of the incident radiation. Okay, so on the Above and below, this electron will have a little bit more radiation coming in towards it than to the left and right, okay, where the radiation is a little bit less intense. Okay? And you can show if you consider the direction uh, dependence and the polarization of just normal Thomson scattering that the scattered light that comes out to you will be polarized in this horizontal direction. Okay? So that's what Thomson scattering calculation gives you. Why is that? Can you get some intuition for that? Um, well, if you look at dipole radiation from a moving, uh, from an oscillating charged particle, what you find is that it's, the polarization is pretty simple. If the particle is moving this way, it emits light that's polarized in the plane of oscillation. Okay, so if this electron is, mo is oscillating this direction, the polarized light will be also polarized horizontally. Kind of makes sense. On the other hand, if the electron is moving up and down, you'll produce polarization that's going up and down. So the question is, 
if I have this kind of setup, where it's hot above and cold to the left and right, which way is the electron going to oscillate? Any ideas? Well, it has to go left and right, right? Because the, the intensity of the radiation from the top and bottom is stronger. The electric fields are stronger. The forces are stronger that are driving it left and right compared to up and down. Okay, so if I have this kind of radiation pattern, the electron is mainly going to oscillate in one direction, and I mainly will have light that's polarized in this horizontal plane, in this horizontal direction. Okay? So that's why, because the sort of forces on the electron are different, I get polarization if I have a quadrupolar uh, temperature variation that an electron on the last scattering surface sees. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? What's that? Why don't you see circular polarization? Yeah. Um, I guess to have circular polarization, you need a sort of phase. You need this thing to, you, you need, I think you need the electron to sort of orbit in this way. And that's very difficult to arrange with thermal emission that you know, doesn't have a certain phase coherence, right? You're just, uh, but it's a good question if I can get some, I can, I can prove this, but uh, that would be my sort of more intuitive argument. Um, you know, how, how, if I'm just shining a light, how am I going to arrange a nice circular motion? That, that seems difficult. Okay. Um, good. Let's continue. A uh, quick question. Do higher multiples also cause polarization? Uh, no, I think the, the, the polarization is caused by, by this, uh, this quad. All right, so you've understood why the CMB is polarized. It's polarized if, you know, at the last scattering surface, you get scattering of anisotropic quadrupolar uh, radiation. All right, so we know why the CMB is polarized. Now let's describe the polarization field, okay? So we have this image of the polarization. We have a map of how strong the polarization is in the sky. And I'll just tell you wh where we're going. Any polarization map we will show can be decomposed into two types of patterns. Into an E-mode pattern, which looks like this. It's kind of even. And a B-mode pattern, which looks like that. It's kind of swirly and, and odd. And the interesting thing about this decomposition is that all the sort of boring known scalar perturbation physics only makes E-modes whereas gravitational waves make both. And that's why this is a great way, looking for B-modes is a great way uh, to look for inflationary gravitational waves without all this other background. Okay, so that's sort of where we're going. And, and now I'm going to supply the details. Although, are there, is there a question about the big picture? Okay, so now let's talk about what are E-modes and what are B-modes. And how exactly do I describe polarization? So this is going to get a little bit more mathematical, uh, and so feel free to interrupt me. OK, so let's start by just the very basics. How am I going to measure polarization on the sky? All right, so I have a detector here on the bottom left, and I can measure the strength of the electric field squared. That tells me basically how much uh, you know, energy is, is being dumped onto my little thermometer. OK, so one way you could imagine measuring the polarization of the CMB is you could measure you know, how much electric field squared I have in the x-axis, so along this x-axis here. But to make sure I don't pick up unpolarized light, I need to take the difference of this electric field squared minus the one in the y-axis. Okay, And that's what we call the Q-Stokes parameter. Electric field strength in X minus electric field strength in Y. Okay? And polarized light, if it's polarized in the X direction or in the Y direction, it will produce Q, non-zero Q. Now, am I done in describing the polarization? Well, clearly not because I have a magnitude and a direction, so I need to have two degrees of freedom. But also, more physically, 
let's just say I orient my detector like that, but I have some polarization in, this, in, in say, this direction, which I've written as A, then I'm not going to produce any Q. Okay, so there's, uh, if it's polarized that way, there's equal amounts of X and Y polarization and equal amounts of X and Y electric field, so Q will be zero. So if I want to fully describe polarized light in all directions, I need to add an additional Stokes parameter called U, which is basically the same thing but in a coordinate system that's rotated by 45 degrees. Okay, and that's, I'm going to introduce this A and these A and B axes and I'll call U EA squared minus EB squared. And that's, what I can actually measure, I can, I can literally have two sets of detectors, one set of detectors measuring the difference in this axis minus that axis, and then another set of detectors rotated by 45 degrees. We call them Q and U detectors, okay? So now I'm done. I can take my C and D experiment and I can make a map of the Q and U polarization across the sky. And that's indeed what we, what we make in C and D experiments. Uh, we send around maps of Q and U. The problem, though, is that the, what I call Q and what I call U is coordinate dependent. Okay? So if I rotate my coordinate system up away from the x-axis here by an angle uh, phi, then Q and U transform with this kind of rotation matrix here. Okay, so Q and U are coordinate system dependent. They depend on the orientation of my X and Y, and my, on my X, orientation of my X axis. And so I think, you know, in Ichiro Komatsu's CMV lectures, he says, you know, he tells the story about two experimenters who get in a fight to the death because one person measures the C and B polarization in a direction says it's Q, the other one says it's U, and then they kill each other, and then they realize that their experiments were just wrote off by 45 degrees. They're different, you know, they're... Uh, so that is a problem. You know, now everything we measure is, polar, is coordinate system dependent. And we would like to come up with a way of describing the C and B polarization that just like the temperature doesn't depend on, you know, me pointing my coordinate system and my detectors in a certain direction. All right. Now, how can I do that? How can I, you know, but, you know, there isn't a perfect coordinate system in the sky. Any ideas how I could make these Q and U polarizations coordinate system independent? Or is there some physical coordinate system I could use? Well, I've written the answer on the bottom there. In Fourier space, for each mode with a wave vector, a 2D wave vector L, there is an orientation of the coordinate system that's physical and that doesn't depend on my experiment, which is I could orient my reference coordinate system along the direction of the wave vector L that I'm me trying to measure. Okay, so that's the trick. And we'll be going into the details of that now. But basically, the trick to becoming independent of any arbitrary coordinate system is to orient your Q and U coordinate axes along the wave vector direction. All right, so let's go through the details here. All right, so what I find is the Q and U rotate like this. You'll see there's a rotation. Uh, it's not exactly the same as for vectors because these are spin two objects. If I flip them, around uh, by 180 degrees, they're unchanged, so I have to have cos 2 phi. Um, and that's the rotation matrix when I turn my coordinate system up. Now, a compact way of writing this so I don't have to carry around matrices is just define this object Q plus IU, so the imaginary part is U and the real part is Q. And then this uh, rotation of the coordinate system I uh, just gives you a phase e to the minus 2i phi. Okay? So this is the same thing was written more compactly. All right. Now here comes sort of the trick. So I will Fourier transform that, or I'll write it in Fourier space. I'll write Q plus IU as uh, Fourier transform, and the Fourier mode for this combination is AL. 
And as I said, L is the two-dimensional wave vector. Okay, so I'm assuming the flat sky approximation, and you can just imagine taking nice Fourier transforms of the map. So this wave vector L I could write as the modulus of L times cos uh, phi, like this different phi L, where phi L is the angle of the wave vector relative to the x-axis that I'm using, and the same is true for the y component of this wave vector L. All right, so here comes the trick. This hasn't fixed my problem at all. I've just Fourier transformed. I haven't done anything. And so, of course, if I rotate the coordinate system, Q and U change, and the Fourier mode AL will also change. And so to construct an object that doesn't change when I, mo when I rotate my coordinate system, let's slightly modify this Fourier coefficient. Let's take this AL and define a new object, plus 2 AL, in this way. So I write this Fourier mode AL as plus 2 AL times e to the 2i phi L, where phi L is the angle of the wave vector L relative to the x-axis that I'm currently using. Okay, so there's a question, I think, about what do I mean by flat sky, right? So uh, obviously we're just, you know, for the full CMB description, we're thinking in terms of multiples, and I have to deal with spherical harmonics. But for, for lots of CMB physics, it's good enough to just cut out a region of the sky that looks flat. So a small part of the sky, I can just place a plane along that part, small part of the sky and uh, just analyze this square. Okay? So you saw one of those squares I talked about earlier. And then everything gets a little simpler because uh, I can just do Fourier transforms and I can just deal with uh, Fourier modes instead of spherical harmonics. But all defined in 2D along the sort of X and Y grid here. That's the flat sky approximation. And the Fourier transform here uh, will then go to LX and sort of LY. Okay? All right, again, getting back to the trick, I've slightly modified this Fourier coefficient by writing AL is uh, e to the 2i phi L, where phi L is the angle of the wave vector L relative to the x-axis. And that defines this new object here. Now, the, the reason this is a neat trick is because now this object doesn't depend on my coordinate system. And to see that, if phi L here is the angle of that mode L relative to the, the x-axis, and I rotate my x-axis up, then the angle decreases by an amount minus phi. So under rotation, the angle of the Fourier wave vector relative to my x-axis gets changed to phi L minus far phi. Okay, so if I, it starts out with this angle, and I rotate it up, the angle with respect to the x-axis decreases. Okay, does that make sense? The angle relative to the x-axis decreases if I rotate up my x-axis. And the point is that now, with this uh, tricky definition, I get the same factor the same phase factor appearing on the left-hand side for Q plus IU when I rotate my coordinate system as I get on the right-hand side uh, for this plus 2 AL thing. Okay? I get, when I rotate in, on both the left and the right, I get this minus 2 I phi. Sorry, this minus 2 I phi should be underlined here. All right, so by introducing this new object that depends on that it that has a factor of the angle of the Fourier wave vector with respect to the x-axis, I have now made this object plus 2 AL coordinate system independent. Okay, so, you know, I'll post these slides and you can think this through, um, and it does actually work. Okay, are there any questions about that? So, we had the problem that Q plus IU transforms like this when I rotate, and now... This quantity wrote, has, picks up exactly the same phase factor under rotation, and I cancel it, and the, uh, this new object 
is unchanged. So I have now found an object that doesn't depend on the orientation of my coordinate system. And this object I will call uh, E plus IB. Okay, and where E is sort of the real part of that object and B is the imaginary part. Okay, and so therefore we've introduced these E and B modes that are coordinate system orientation independent. And this, then I can do the same for a minus sign for Q plus IU and I get this expression with pluses and minuses. Or equivalently, I get the, uh, this expression. All right, but I think, yeah, hopefully the basics are, are sort of clear here. I've introduced this new ob this new object, a spin two object, and the trick is that I have a pre that I have a factor which contains the angle of the mode with respect to the x-axis, and that absorbs all my coordinate system dependence. So I advise, I would recommend that you work through these pages because it's a little bit much to take in just on the fly. All right, but the key point is I now have an E mode and a B mode, which are independent of my orientation of my coordinate system and are defined via these relations from Q and U. So there's some transforms and multiplications that will take you from Q and U to E and B. Now what is the physical interpretation of this trick where I added this weird E to the minus, you know, E to the two I phi L, what am I doing? Basically what I'm doing is I'm rotating the frame describing Q and U to be aligned with the wave vector for each mode. And then it's uniquely defined. Okay? That's the trick. Does that make sense? There's a special frame direction aligned with the wave vector. I define Q and U relative to that direction. And then I get... Um, E and B modes, and E and B modes are Q and U relative to that coordinate system. They're relative to the coordinate system aligned with the wave vector. All right, let me give you a little bit more intuition for what E and B are. Okay, so if we consider one mode aligned with the x-axis here, then Q is just E L E to the I L X. And so the E mode just looks like this. All right, so I have a positive Q, negative Q, et cetera. And the B mode is not parallel or perpendicular to the wave vector, but it's now oriented at 45 degrees. All right, so. Here's some, if, if you got lost by the mathematics, please come back now and remember these few basic things about E and B. So E modes are Q in the frame oriented with the wave vector. And crucially, E modes are parallel and, or per, and perpendicular to the wave vector. Okay, so the, anything that's along or perpendicular to the wave vector, that's an E mode. On the other hand, B modes, are Q relative to the, are U relative to the wave vector, and are at 45 degrees to the direction of the wave vector. Okay, so if I have a pattern that's varying in this direction, E is parallel or perpendicular, and B is at 45 degrees. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that sort of basic statement? E is parallel and perpendicular to the wave vector, and B is at 45 degrees to the wave vector. You can also look at the parity properties by just taking a reflection, and you'll see that E is unchanged, but this, this B mode rod flips, and you can go back to the definition and see that that becomes minus B, right? U goes to, if I rotate by, uh, by 90 degrees, it becomes minus U. Right, so we conclude that E modes are parity even and B modes are parity odd. All right, why did I go through this whole you know, mathematical procedure 
Well, first of all, as I said, we don't want those experimenters to fight to the death about what's Q and U. We want to have something that's coordinate system independent. And that is nice. But there's actually a, a, a much more important reason why we do this E and B decomposition. And that reason is the following. By symmetry, scalar perturbations only make one of these two types of polarization. They only make E modes. And that's super important for finding gravitational waves. Okay, so why do scalar perturbations, the normal types of, normal types of perturbations that we uh, see and that come from a curvature perturbation, why do those only make E modes? Well, you can see that by imagining a section of the last scattering surface, and let's just say there's a density wave going through that. By symmetry, this density wave can only produce patterns that are either along that wave vector or perpendicular to it. I can't just randomly orient the polarization pattern. That would sort of break the symmetry that this configuration has. Okay? And scalars just have you know, one degree of freedom for each mode, just an amplitude. I don't have any other degrees of freedom that I can use to introduce any kind of deviation from the symmetry around the wave vector. So everything I produce with a scalar perturbation that just has an amplitude has to be symmetric around the wave vector, and therefore either parallel to the wave vector or perpendicular to the wave vector, as you can see in this uh, polarization pattern that's actually produced by this density wave. And so parallel or perpendicular to the wave vector, that means E modes. And the same is true if I superpose many different modes. Scalar perturbations by symmetry can only produce E modes. I don't have enough degrees of freedom to do anything else. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Well, right. Yeah. I should be able to repeat, analyze can, can one. Can you repeat oh, the yeah, question? Yeah. So you understand that um, degrees of freedom are limited for one k vector, but I have many k vectors, so don't I have enough information to produce b? I, I think the answer is that you know, I should be able to analyze the linearity of all the equations it means I should be able to analyze one, you know, one k vector at a time and then superpose those, right? So if this holds for one, it has to also sort of hold for the superposition, right? Uh, so I, I, I can't, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't do that. Um, and I, I should be able to analyze each wave vector at a time. Right? So that wave vector, that particular mode, all I can tell you with a scalar perturbation is an amplitude. And that's it. I have no information to add other directions. All right, and it's different for B modes. And, I'll, and, and it's different for, uh, sorry, it's different for gravitational waves. And I'll come back to that in a second. All right, let me just produce a quick aside about E modes. E modes are really cool cosmological observables. All right? Um, they are, because we can, you know, they're produced by scalar perturbations. And for gravitational wave searches, that's annoying. But for other cosmology, that's really cool. We can measure E mode power spectra. We can measure E modes crossed with temperature modes. And indeed, um, you can do really cool stuff, like you predict the E mode power spectrum based on a fit just to the temperature, and it works perfectly. And you, know, you can see here, the temperature power spectra are now more, more and more being complemented by E mode power spectra and temperature cross E mode power spectra, TE power spectra. So we now have these new sources of information and that are being mined. Uh, right. Just as an aside, maybe a, I don't have that much time, right? I only have like 10 more minutes. OK. Uh, if, if you want, I can explain to you why this, uh, um, this E mode power spectrum has, looks like a sine oscillation. There's a justification that I'll leave on this slide uh, for why it's a sign, basically you can prove it looks like the velocity because if I want to generate a quadrupole, I can generate that quadrupole by expanding the velocity to leading order, 
that I have to go to second order to generate a quadrupole for the density perturbation. I'm going to just gloss over that, and I'm happy to take questions on that. All right. The key point is E modes are useful, and scalars only make E modes. Scalar perturbations can only make E mode patterns. They don't have enough degrees of freedom. On the other hand, gravitational waves do. Gravitational waves have enough degrees of freedom to not just produce E modes, but they can also produce B modes. And so why, you know, why do gravitational waves have, why do tensor perturbations for each mode have more freedom than scalar perturbations? What, what is that additional degree of freedom? Yeah, but sort of physically. And so there's a polarization direction that, that gives us additional information. Okay, so, yeah, polarization, there we go, thank you. Um, yeah, so gravitational waves, now I'm, you know, with scalars I have a mode that's intersecting the last scattering surface, there's just an amplitude, and everything has to be symmetric. With gravitational waves, I now, you know, have a polarization direction that I can choose, and I can choose to orient that so that I also generate patterns at 45 degrees to the wave vector. And I have more freedom, and I can, uh, depending on how I orient my polarization, I can generate both patterns. Okay, does that basic idea make sense? Yeah. Right? E modes are perpendicular and parallel to the wave vector. Scalars don't have enough degrees of freedom. By symmetry, they can only make E, but gravitational waves now I can you know, mess around with the direction of polarization, and I can also generate uh, B modes. All right. And that is why looking for B modes is, you know, currently the best way of looking for inflationary gravitational waves. All of the boring scalar perturbations only make E modes. And all of these patterns are locked up in the E modes. And the B modes are this pristine null channel with nothing in them. No scalar perturbations at leading order produce B modes. And so, I, it, you know, it's this pure, nice, beautiful null map. And so I could see even a tiny level of gravitational waves clearly without cosmic variance and confusion from all the scalar perturbations I already understand. Okay, so, you know, if there's a tiny level of gravitational waves, unlike with the temperature, that now pops up because all the scalars are locked up in the E mode. Are there questions about, you know, about that basic picture, why B modes are the best way for looking for gravitational waves? Does that make sense? All right. And that is why looking for these gravitational wave induced B modes is, you know, the main effort or one of the major efforts of CMB research uh, in the next decade. We're trying to find B modes produced by gravitational waves from inflation. And, you know, in particular what you look for is you look for a a B mode power spectrum that has a very characteristic shape. And you can measure its amplitude, which directly depends on the amplitude of the tensor power spectrum. So you, there's a quantity R, the power of the tensors, over the power of the scalar perturbations, which just dials this uh, gravitational wave from inflation spectrum up and down. So we are now actively looking for that. And if we could find it, it would be completely amazing. All right, how are we doing this? Well, we're building better and better CMB telescopes, mainly on the ground located at some of the best sites. And the best sites for doing these sort of observations are generally really high up in really dry sites because uh, the, the water in the atmosphere produces noise for these kind of experiments. And so you either build them at 6,000 meters high up in the Atacama Desert in the mountains or you go to the South Pole, because high up in the mountains is too easy. Um, and yeah, so there are several telescopes now looking for these B modes from primordial inflationary gravitational waves, some of them located in the Atacama, uh, like right now, uh, uh, polar bear and, uh, and ACT, although they're mainly focusing on smaller scale science, and in particular now on the South Pole, uh, the BICEP experiment, 
So that's what's going on now in terms of the experiments searching from these, for these gravitational waves from inflation from the early universe. What's coming up next is in the Atacama Simons Observatory, a big array of these enormous, uh, both tiny telescopes and an enormous telescope. And then later in the decade, the sort of ultimate ground-based CMB uh, telescope called CMB Stage 4. And so these sorts of telescopes are hoping to improve the current bounds uh, by a significant amount. All right, so where are we in terms of these B-mode searches? As I've said, uh, we're looking for these characteristic B-mode power spectrum patterns. We're constraining the amplitude R of this inflationary B-mode polarization pattern. So the current measurements are these ones. Now, BICEP here has uh, a detection of something. This time around, they don't claim it's inflationary gravitational wave. But this is, is lensing. I'll mention that in a second. And right now, we just have an upper limit. We know that R is less than 0.036 at 95% confidence. But we would really like to make progress in this search, at least by you know, around two orders of magnitude to rule out R of 10 to the minus 3, because many interesting models produce inflationary gravitational waves at that level. So we want to make progress. But it is very hard. And there, there are two main reasons why it's hard to make progress, aside from that it's hard to build good instruments. The first problem with getting better and better measurements of inflationary gravitational waves is foregrounds. You know, scalar perturbations at leading order only make E modes. But if you have some very complicated nonlinear physics in the galaxy, like galactic dust, there's no reason it respects a nice symmetry. So that will, emission from galactic dust will also produce B-mode polarization. And indeed, BICEP thought they had found real inflationary gravitational wave B-modes uh, several years ago now, but in fact they had just found galactic dust. So that's a real challenge. But luckily, as we talked about, Dust doesn't emit a black body, you know, this, you know, the same black body distribution as the CMB, and so you can hope to separate it out with data at different frequencies. The other difficulty that we'll talk about more next lecture is that the CMB is gravitationally lensed along its path, along the photon's path to our telescopes. And even if you start out with a nice, pure, even E mode pattern, if you start distorting that pattern, you produce some amount of, of B-mode. So lensing couples some of the original E-modes into B-modes, and that is another source of background. But if we can get around these problems, and we can find inflationary gravitational waves, or even just constrain them, that will be extremely interesting, not just for confirming the inflationary paradigm, but we'll learn more about what models of inflation are viable. Right? So a measurement, and the details here are that a measurement of R, in addition to a measurement of the scalar spectral index, can be related via the slow roll parameters and some assumptions to you know, the shape of the potential, the, the first and second derivatives of the potential. Okay? So for each inflationary potential, with some assumptions, you can make predictions for what levels of R and what values of NS you should have. And so you can draw this plane of R and NS where different models produce different predictions. And a measurement of R will then allow us to, you know, for example, rule out classes of inflationary models. So it's pretty crazy that we're able to constrain physics at you know, a trillion times the energy of the LHC. So that, even ruling out models if we can push our bounds down by two orders of magnitude, it would be amazing. But obviously, the coolest thing would be if we find these inflationary gravitational waves and can study a lot more about the physics of the very early universe directly. All right, so that's all I have to say. Thanks.
re remember to repeat. Oh, sorry. So, what, right. The question is, what if we rule out all these models? How low should we go? Um, yeah, before we give up. I mean, it's a, it's a good question, and there's a similar question in several observables in, in cosmology like W. How close to W is minus one do we go? Uh, I think to some extent, there, for this R case, maybe there's some obvious targets, just you know, both NS, NS minus one depends on, uh, on two slow roll parameters, right? And R just depends on one of them. So, you know, you'd probably want to go, we've already ruled out signals of order NS minus one for R. So you'd probably at least want to go towards, you know, that squared. And that's sort of the target roughly that we're going after now. Um, but yeah, it's a good question how much further you want to push. To, to some extent, what you're showing is that there's a hierarchy between this, you know, okay, and S minus one is not tiny. It's a few percent. So some combination of these slow roll parameters is a few percent. And if we're, if we're pushing down epsilon more and more and more, I guess it's kind of interesting in the sense that, you know, why is this first derivative of the potential so much smaller than the second derivative, right? You have to maybe have some explanation for why it's so flat but still has a, has a curvature. But yeah, it, I don't think there's a good answer to your question. I think technically it could be anything. But if it's super low, maybe it's interesting and that the potential has to be amazingly flat. Um, and yeah, certainly we'd like to find and rule out models of NS minus one squared, 10 to the minus three-ish, that kind of order of magnitude. But then going beyond that, I, I'm also not sure. So, you said that uh, B mode can be generated from the E mode due to the lensing, right? Yeah. So how we can distinguish these two B modes uh, from inflationary and uh, from... Yeah, uh, that's a great question, and we will talk about that next time. Um, so effectively, we have other ways of measuring the gravitational lensing that produces this okay. lensing B mode. And so we can sort of figure out what the B mode from lensing should be. And, and actually even remove it. So there's a way you can do something called delensing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit, bit about that next So time. the lensing will affect uh, also in the very large scale uh, part of the B-mode, or? Yeah, so let me just show you what the lensing exactly looks like. So, right, this is plotting the uh, B-mode power spectrum, and uh, the gravitational wave inflationary B-mode is this kind of oscillatory uh, pattern here. Okay, so do you see the, the dashed line? Mm -hmm. And the lensing part is the solid line here. All right, so that's what the lensing produces. Thanks. So there was another question in the chat, okay. uh, which was, can you distinguish the E mode that is primordial from anything else? E mode that's primordial from anything else. So uh, you mean is there a problem with distinguishing the primordial, like the original E mode polarization from foregrounds? I assume that's what they Right, yeah. yeah. So, so why jump all the way to B modes? Well, right. So, so B modes are particularly useful if you want to go after gravitational waves because they're not produced by scalars. And so you don't have this confusion in cosmic variance from the, the scalar perturbations if you want to go after tiny levels of inflationary gravitational waves. But obviously, it is true that, the, as I said, the E-mode power spectrum uh, here is an amazing cosmological observable. Um, and you know, we can learn a huge amount from it about cosmological parameters. In fact, for some cosmological parameters, it has more information than the temperature because it only has a sign term, and so it's more strongly peaked. So it's, it's actually a more powerful observable. OK, but the question was, you know, do I have to worry about non-primordial sources of E-mode as well? And the answer is yes, I do. But generally, the dust will make similar amounts of E and B. And if we say that the, you know, the, the problem for the dust is, means that the dust is sort of at the level of the B-modes, 
the E modes are much larger. So you know, compared to the signal in the E modes, the foregrounds are a much smaller problem, right? So the foregrounds are similar in E and B, but the E mode signal is way larger, so you don't have as much of an issue. That's sort of the short answer. But yes, we, you do have to worry about it a little bit. You do have to do uh, some foreground cleaning and foreground testing to make sure even your E mode power spectrum, even though it's so large, you still need to make sure it's, it's not contaminated by dust, for example. So it is still a problem. Signal's bigger, less of a problem. Sorry, I always get confused when looking at a real uh, map of polarization. Okay. I can't distinguish between E mode and B mode by looking at those maps. Can you? Uh, at the actual maps? About? Yeah, yeah. Or, In a real I, map that we see. Well, I mean, to be honest, you, usually experiments can produce maps of T, E, and B, right? So often what we analyze we take a Q and U map, we transform them to E and B, and we make E and B maps. Um, and yeah, at the map level, it's a little bit hard to uh, uh, to just sort of distinguish. Yeah, those are both Gaussian random fields, and they just have a different power spectrum, basically. So it's a little hard. Yeah, I don't know exactly how you want to distinguish it. You mean at a, at a map of the sort of polarization yeah, yeah. fields? Yeah, it, it is a little bit hard to, to do this sort of by eye. Uh, I mean, basically, if you see there's a variation, let's just say there's a variation in the strength of polarization in a certain direction, then, you know, as I was saying, you need to look for patterns that are along or at 90 degrees to that direction of variation. Um, that's sort of the best I could say. I, I, guess, I guess another feature is this kind of, that B modes, because of their parity odd nature, produce sort of more swirly patterns. That's if, if you want to have a kind of heuristic by eye guide to what's a B mode. Generally, kind of rotational uh, patterns are are B modes rather than E modes. But anyway, yeah, th that that's just a by eye guide. I think the formal way to do this is to you know do a, do a transform, do a conversion, and then you'll automatically get the right E and B modes. No one will ask you to by eye say if this is a B mode mm. or not. And. Uh... How do we measure these polarizations? And yeah. Is, is its precision just like the temperature map or not? Right, OK. So uh, uh, right. basically, if I measure, uh, how do I measure a temperature map? Effectively, I measure the incident, the strength of incident radiation uh, based on how much it sort of heats up uh, a thermometer, it's called a bolometer. Okay, so I have some thermometer with known properties, and I measure how much, in, you know, how intense the radiation is based on how much that thermometer gets heat up, heat, heated up. And I look in different directions in the sky. The only difference for polarization is I build some waveguide, and okay, that effectively uh, only is sent, it only funnels light of one polarization onto a thermometer. Okay, so I have uh, effectively, uh, I, I don't know how I can draw a thermometer, so I'm going to draw a terrible thermometer. I'll just draw a thermometer like this. So I have a waveguide that basically only funnels uh, light of this polarization of E X, or let's, let's call it E Y, uh, polarization onto the thermometer. And then I have another waveguide that funnels light of the X polarization only onto a thermo another thermometer. And then if I take the difference between the heating of the EX squared thermometer and the EY squared thermometer, then I get Q. Okay, so I take, you know, basically Q is, uh, well, I, for, I, for, make me, I forget the sign here, but I basically difference, difference the heating of the two thermometers, one of which is sensitive to this polarization, the other one is sensitive to that polarization. And, and, and then I have to, so that's like a Q detector. And then I have to build another type of detector, which is this thing that's rotated by, uh, by 45 degrees, right? And I mean, I can show you again one of these bolometers. 
Let's see, where is the bolometer? So here's a picture of, I think, an actual bolometer. And I believe what happens here is that, uh, you know, you have these two detect these two waveguides are basically uh, this set here and this set here will go on to different uh, thermometers or different bolometers. And so there's sen this one is sensitive to polarization up down and this, this is sensitive to polarization left right. But the basic idea is two waveguides sensitive to two different polarizations lead to different bolometers and I take the difference and that gives me Q and then I have another set of detectors that measures U. Sorry for these terrible drawings. Uh, is circular polarization uh, distinguishable this way? Uh, no. Um, I think, so here, you, I, I think you'll get zero response from circular polarization. I think there are, if you want to measure circular polarization, th there are ways to do that. I mean, I think, I think you can, you know, you, you need to introduce a phase shift to one of the polarizations, right? And so there, there are ways there's sort of ways of doing that. So you, you can build, for example, interferometer. You can build funny sort of path lengths of the photons that introduce, you know, exactly the, what, I, I forget what phase it is, like 90 degrees, something like that, 45 degrees. Anyway, you, you can introduce optical elements that will, will, will do this. We'll, we'll introduce a phase shift, and then you will, you're, you're able to, with the same technology, uh, measure circular polarization. Um, so, yeah, you, you can do that. Let's break for coffee. Let's break for coffee. See you back at 11:15. Yeah.